we are today, November 22nd, 60th anniversary to the day of the uh, Kennedy assassination. But the other day that you probably remember because of, uh, is this December 7th, 1941. Just out of a curiosity, is, is there a corporate memory in Judge Griffin's mind about that particular day? Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Nine years old at the time, and uh, I somehow remember uh, my parents telling me what had happened and uh, walking outside, uh, I don't recall any snow on the ground, and walking across the front lawn to one of my friend's house. Mm -hmm. Did it mean anything other than that? I mean, just oh, sure it did. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. And many years later, you, you find yourself uh, uh, you know, going through your normal academics here in Cleveland, and you talked about it in a podcast I just heard a little bit about being a, a native here of Cleveland. Uh, were you destined to be a lawyer, ultimately? Well, my father was a judge, uh, and uh, my father uh, was somebody I greatly admired, and uh, so I probably was destined to be, a, to be a lawyer. Did you go to any of his courtrooms? Did you ever sit in on any of that? Well, I never actually sat in. My father was the, wound up as the Chief Justice of the Cleveland Municipal, Municipal Court, and uh, I, I sat in on some settlement conferences, but I never actually heard him pre preside over anything. Did he bring, did he bring work home? Did, is he kind of like No, he, he never brought any work home. Yeah. And, uh, we went to baseball games together. <laughs> go, go tribe. Yeah. You ultimately find your, you went to Korea, right? You were I, I, well, I was in the service during when the Korean War was still going on. Yep. Uh, but no, there was no fighting going on. Yep. And I never got out of, out of Texas. Right. So I was stationed in Fort Bliss, Texas uh, after basic training. Now, your, your background ultimately gets you to being a lawyer, uh, finding your way to Cleveland, Back to Cleveland. Back to Cleveland. Actually, back to Cleveland. Um, working in a firm at the time, you were probably the one of six lawyers. Right. In a, in a law firm, and then you get a call. Right. Then you get a call, and maybe, and obviously, before that occurred, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. Maybe for the camera, where were you, and how did you learn about that? Uh, it was. Shortly after lunch on Friday, November 22nd, uh, I was getting onto an elevator on the first floor of my office building. And as I stepped onto the elevator, someone said to me, the president has been shot. And my first reaction was, oh my God, uh, those damn segregationists. Uh, and uh, obviously we rode up to the office uh, we didn't have television sets in the office. In those days, I walked, walked into the entrance to the office and the receptionist was there and, I, and she didn't have a radio on. Uh, I told her the president had been shot and then probably within an hour of the time uh, that I got upstairs, uh, I learned that he died. And the office closed and we went home and spent the entire weekend watching television. What did you see on television a couple days later? Yeah, I saw Jack Ruby shoot Lee Oswald. Shocked. The world and angry. Yeah. I saw it also. I mean, the whole, the whole process. We all lived it. We kind of like, where were you on November 22nd? And then the, the actual shooting occurred on, what, the 24th? Correct. Um, did you get a sense? I mean, here you are, a lawyer, and you're in the business. Uh, you had an immediate reaction regarding the segreg those damn segregationists because it's in the South, and Texas, I believe, was pretty segregated at that time. A absolutely. For the they, were, they, were, they were beginning to integrate schools uh, starting with kindergarten or the first grade. Right. 
Did you get a, uh, I guess for the camera, again, we're trying to educate people who are going to watch this in 1963, a little bit about the country's segregation at the time? You know? Well, that, that was the essential domestic conflict. Uh, Martin Luther King was trying to bring an end uh, to racial segregation. And uh, schools, schools were uh, uh, implementing, I was, I'm not going to say trying, they, they were implementing the uh, Brown versus Board of Education ruling by uh, implementing it through, with all deliberate speed. Well, all deliberate speed <laughs> meant uh, a couple of kids <laughs> in the lowest classes and working their way up to the high school level and complete segregation uh, in, at the college and university level in all of the southern states. Uh, and so the, uh, the first breakthrough had been in 1962 uh, at the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, uh, it was a completely segregated system, uh, and uh, African Americans, uh, Negroes as they were referred to in those days, uh, were uh, not admitted to hotels, to restaurants. Uh, uh, there, was, there were restrictions on Grocery stores, they couldn't sit at counters and uh, eating counters and drug. We had eat. We 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 did not we did not have uh, uh, fast food restaurants uh, as much as we had eating counters in drug stores, uh, and they were not allowed to uh, sit at the eating counters. Uh, so that was what the battle was about about racial segregation. While we're there in 1962, uh, as I mentioned off camera, both Cindy and I had the pleasure for a couple of days to have as our guest Jim James Meredith. Yes. And he plays into your story as well, and I may be jumping a little bit ahead. We also had the pleasure of having John Doerr uh, as, as a guest of our house uh, separately. Uh, so we kind of lived that particular incident, but it, there's more to that story and, and James Meredith. and. Um, General Walker. Well, I, I don't know whether you want to jump ahead at this point and talk about it, but maybe we can plant the seed by saying, since we're talking about segregation that occurred in '62, that this event occurred and General Walker was part of that. And uh, it, it was General Walker's participation in an effort by General Walker to prevent James Meredith from entering the University of Mississippi. Uh, it was that effort by Walker that led to the assassination of President Kennedy. Seed planted, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you got Dallas, Texas. Uh, the president announces really just a few days ahead of time, maybe 10 days ahead of time that he was gonna come to Dallas. Uh, well, it was, it was known that he was coming to Dallas before uh, from late late September, the the plan was there, but but the question of, about where he was going to give his speech uh, had not been worked out. Was at, at, at that time, again, kind of chronologically, uh, he's coming to Dallas. There was uh, activities going on, including uh, stuff which dealt with the. Uh, 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 Weisman and Bernard was, Weisman. Yeah, I found that incredibly <clears throat> interesting. I had no idea till I read your book. But again, seed planting here. Uh, what is the wise? What was the Weisman ad, and who was he? Bernard Weisman was a recently released uh, Army veteran. He. I don't know whether he was an enlistee or a draftee, but he was, he was an enlisted man who had been stationed uh, in, in Europe in, in, NATO, in one of the NATO countries, I think it actually was Germany, and uh, was part of a very small group of enlisted men, and when I say very small, probably a half a dozen people who considered themselves uh, 
cons political conservatives and who had decided to join together when they got out of the service and came back to the United States to infiltrate the conservative movement in the United States. And uh, Bernard Weissman, uh, who actually lived in suburban New York City, Mount Vernon, New York, uh, uh, came to Dallas at the request of the leader of this veterans group. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, uh, about two and a half weeks or three weeks before the assassination of President Kennedy. And he came to help them put together uh, some money for what turned out to be a full-page anti-Kennedy ad. Mm. And the, uh, the, the ad uh, was, uh, was published in the Dallas Morning News on the morning of November 22nd. And it, it was headed, uh, welcome to Dallas, Mr. President, but of course it was not a welcoming at all, and it proceeded uh, to list a, a full page of highlighted attacks on President Kennedy, and it was signed with the name Bernard Weissman. Uh, and uh, that signature, the, the ad, and that signature with the name Bernard Weissman, what caused uh, Jack Ruby to become the first uh, conspiracy investigators with respect to the assassination. Since you, well, we're gonna, we are jumping around a little bit, but we <coughs> might as well dive into Jack Ruby biographically. Uh, who was he? Jack, Jack Ruby was a nightclub owner, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm probably uh, not doing it justice because it was a striptease nightclub. <laughs> And uh, uh, he was, uh, he was actually had been a native of Chicago, uh, moved uh, to uh, Dallas, uh, opened a striptease nightclub called the Carousel Club. And on the morning of the assassination, he was at the Dallas Morning News placing his own advertisements. Uh, uh, and, uh, and he was very upset by this ad that he saw that was signed Bernard Weissman. And the, the ad actually had a black border on it. It was, understand, it was a full page ad with a black border around. Like around. A morning border. And that's the way Ruby interpreted it. Yeah. He, he interpreted it as a sign that somehow the black border was tied to the assassination and that whoever was had put the ad in with the black border was somehow involved in the assassination. And Ruby was very upset with the name Bernard Weissman on the advertisement because uh, Ruby, who was Jewish, whose name originally had, had been Rubenstein uh, and uh, was uh, changed by his whole family uh, to a, a more anglicized name, uh, last name of Jack of Ruby. Uh, anyhow, Jack Ruby, who recognized the name Weissman as probably being somebody who was Jewish, the view was that nobody who was Jewish could be anti-Kennedy. And therefore, this was probably a fictitious name that was signed to the ad. And, uh, and Ruby, uh, as I said, became the first conspiracy investigator. Uh, and Ruby, with his great investigative skills, looked in the telephone directory and didn't find the name Bernard Weissman in the Dallas telephone directory, obviously because he didn't live in Dallas and had only recently come to Dallas. Uh, a, a friend who was a lawyer, incidentally, uh, suggested that he look uh, in a street directory. And he looked in the street directory and didn't find the name Bernard Weissman. Uh, so he really became convinced uh, that Weissman was a fictitious name and he had a great fear that uh, Jews would be blamed for the assassination of President Kennedy. So uh, he 
tried to get as close as he could to the investigative process. And after going to temple services on Friday night uh, to ingratiate himself with the police department, he, bought, he purchased six corned beef sandwiches and a half a dozen soft drinks, took them to the Dallas police station, uh, offered them to the police, but the police knew Jack Ruby. <laughs> and uh, uh, they asked him why he was there, and he said he was a translator for the Israeli press. And he, and he, he, he crafted a little badge that he, that he put on himself. Uh, and so that, that was Ruby trying to pursue and get as much information as he could about the assassination because he was sure that Weissman was a fictitious name and that the ad was somehow tied into the assassination itself and that Jews would be, would be, be blamed for the assassination. Now the story of Weissman is his own story. Sure. And I don't know whether you want to hear that. I'd love to because this is a piece of the puzzle I had no idea. All right. Uh, Weissman was Jewish. Uh, uh, and the reason Weissman put his name on the ad was that he wanted the world, or at least the, the Dallas world, to know that not all Jews were, were liberals. And so, so, so Ruby, so, so Ruby who, who thinking that Jews would, would be blamed for the assassination, uh, Weissman put his name on the ad uh, because it was a conservative, John, it was a John Birch Society ad. It was financed by people, and I don't know how many of our viewers and listeners will remember the John Birch Society, but it was a very active uh, and very well-financed conservative uh, pressure group uh, at that particular time in the 1960s. And, uh, and uh, we can get later to the facts of the uh, motivation of Oswald, which tie in with, actually, with uh, uh, General Edwin Walker and the, the Walker movement and the tie-in with the black border Weissman ad. It's so intriguing. Though your book is so well written, it's a page turner, and uh, and a part of that was the Weissman, the Walsh, the you know the, all of these various tentacles that uh, kind of come together through your in investigation on the commission. Uh, and what you, we should probably get you to the commission. Uh, you're watching all this, you watch Jack Ruby, you watch what occurred at the, in the Dallas, and then about a month or so later, you actually get a phone call. Yep. How did that happen? Well, I, I was a young lawyer, uh, and, uh, 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 went to cocktail parties with other young lawyers and one of the people who was working as an assistant to Robert Kennedy had been a lawyer in Cleveland whom I had met at a cocktail party uh, and uh, the uh, when the Warren Commission was being organized uh, his name incidentally was Dave Filveroff who who is uh, who teaches? Who had had been teaching, or, or in more recent years, I, I he may not even be alive now, uh, but uh, he 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 taught at a law school in Buffalo. Uh, but uh, uh, Dave Filveroff, at the time of the assassination, and and at the time that uh, the Warren Commission was being organized. Uh, and Filveroff was working for Robert Kennedy. Uh, he was contacted by one of the people in the Justice Department uh, to suggest names of people who might be staff to the Warren Commission. And uh, understand this is 1963, mm -hmm. and the Warren Co Commission uh, wanted to have a diverse makeup. Uh, diversity in 1963 was not the same as diversity in 2023. Uh, there were no women professionals on the staff. Uh, out of all the lawyers, and we probably had in total with assistant counsel and then other staff people who were assisted us, uh, we probably had 
25 lawyers on the staff. Uh, uh, there was one African American. Uh, so diversity was geographic diversity. <laughs> and uh, my friend who had worked in Cleveland and was then working for Robert Kennedy uh, knew, knew me. Uh, and uh, they, they wanted people who had trial experience, who had had uh, criminal justice experience. I had been an assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the Cleveland office. And so basically I was the only person he knew who, who met those qualifications. So I was, I was the man from Ohio. But you had also been, you had experience being a prosecutor, so you were, you were of that investigative world at that time. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, what was your immediate reaction? Did you assume there was a wrong phone call? I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> and and once, once it was clarified that he hadn't dialed the wrong number, uh, uh, and uh, he asked me if I would be interested. There was no question I would be interested. I called my wife uh, and told her that I'd had the phone call. Uh, I think she began to to pack our bags right away. Ah. But but he was only calling to ask if I would send in my resume. Okay. So I, I did that. And, and you did get a call from? And I did it from Howard Willens. I, I, actually, I can't remember exactly who it was from, but I know I was contacted one way or another by Howard Willens and uh, was offered the job. And so uh, I had probably received this uh, call from Dave Filveroff at the very, very end of December. And on January 10th, we were in Washington. I'm just curious that, so you're all there and you kind of look around and you don't probably know anybody in the room, uh, your staffers, and you do get a chance to meet the Chief Justice. That's right. What was that like? Well, uh, it was a thrilling experience. Uh, and it's one I remember so vividly. Uh, our first staff meeting was uh, a week or so after I arrived. And uh, the words I remember most vividly were that he said to us, your only client is the, the truth. Wow. And, See, that's uh, profound. Yeah, and that, and that was our message. Our, our job was to find out what happened. And how did they separate? Now, first of all, how many assistant councils were there? There was a general council, right? There was a, the general council, and I think 15 assistant council. 15, 16. Did somebody sit down and decide, all right, we've got this big landscape. Sure. A lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of things went on with tippets we even talked about, but we've got uh, Oswald, we've got Ruby. But sure. Well, it was divided in, in the six areas of investigation. And uh, uh, two of us. Uh, myself and Leon Hubert were assigned to investigate Jack Ruby. Uh, 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 three of the uh, lawyers uh, one, were assistants, in effect, uh, to J. Lee Rankin, who was the general counsel. Mm -hmm. So we, we had it divided into six areas of two people working on it, and then three other people who had more general responsibilities and, and uh, were, re were reporting uh, on a very regular basis to Rankin. Uh, but, you know, we were really, we as staff people were, in a sense, not the first line of, invest of investigation hmm. because we had the entire FBI, the entire Secret Service, in fact, we had uh, any uh, state or local agency that we wanted to call on uh, to give us help, and they would they volunteered help. So the interviewing, the, the uh, by the time actually we arrived to work in mid January of 1964, uh, there there had probably been 10,000 people or more who had already been invested, who had already been interviewed. Uh, in connection with the assassination. So what our initial task was to look at the, at the interviews and uh, to decide, and, and incidentally, there had already been an overall report based on those interviews 
written by the FBI. And, uh, and initially our, our question was whether, how much of that report we were going to accept. Mm -hmm. uh, but in going at that, we had all of the basic documents. And so we were then looking at the question of who are the important witnesses. Uh, uh, we, we were going to take and did take testimony, sworn testimony from them, and we instructed the investigative agencies to conduct further investigation. So, did you have subpoena power? Yes. Because you had subpoena power. And I learned again for the first time in your book that the crime if, that you were investigating was not a federal crime. That's right. There, 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 it was not a federal crime to murder the president. Can you imagine that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Texas crime because it occurred in Texas. So the first line of investigation was the Dallas Police Department. And people, people forget that. You know, Lee Oswald was arrested by the Dallas Police Department, not the FBI or the Secret Service. Yeah. And he was charged with a state crime. Well, I just have a curiosity. Uh, he, after the shooting, and, and of which there were some and he reports some, some witnesses, but yes, there was also, in tracking him down, he committed another crime. You know, that's very important. And, and those, these few minutes, and it really was only a few minutes, from the time the president was shot until Oswald was arrested in the Dallas, in the Texas theater in Dallas, which was about an, hour, about an hour later. I think that tells us more about who Oswald was mm -hmm. and who was, what his motive was and who was shooting the president than almost anything else that we have. And the evidence is very, very clear. It, it, is, un, it is undisputed once, once you get to it. And yet the people who want to talk about conspiracies uh, never tell you about that. Uh, and so your, your point that you're raising is, yes, he committed another murder uh, within about a half hour of the time that he assassinated the president. What do we know happened? Uh, we know that there were two eyewitnesses to the shooting of President Kennedy, uh, that Howard Brennan, uh, a pipe fitter who was on a lunch break in his early 40s, and uh, Amos Ewens, a 14-year-old who was probably cutting school, who was, <laughs> who was in Dealey Plaza, and, and both of them, each of them, had a, a chance to look up into the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository and see shots being fired from the sixth floor window. So very quickly, and they were able to give identifications, incidentally, of the uh, individual who was doing the shooting, and the identifications were broadcast very quickly over the Dallas police radio. So, 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 so there, there was a description of, of a white male, uh, thought to be perhaps in his early 30s, uh, firing a rifle. Uh, the police very quickly uh, went into the, from the, the what's called the, the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, the police uh, very and, and the sheriff's officers very quickly got to the sixth floor and they found on the sixth floor uh, a set of boxes stepped, stacked up in a window in, uh, on the southeast corner uh, of the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, stacked up in a way that they could serve as a parapet from which to shoot. Oswald's, Lee Oswald's fingerprints were on uh, those boxes. They were, they were found very close to the, to the boxes that were set up on the floor, three cartridges, which had been obviously expelled from a weapon. And then about probably 15 or 20 feet away, uh, in between a stack of boxes, there was a rifle. The rifle, it turns out, had been purchased 
by Lee Harvey Oswald and had his fingerprints on it. Mm. So uh, uh, the question then was, of course they didn't know until this investigation was done that it was Lee Harvey Oswald. But, but so the question was, who was, who was the shooter? Well, we know what Oswald did because Oswald then was seen uh, a few minutes after the, the shooting. By the uh, way, he was an employee of the Texas... He was, yes, he was an employee of the Texas School Book Depository. Okay. And he, uh, he, was, he was seen in, in, in the, uh, I'll call it the lunchroom of the Texas School Book Depository on the second floor. Uh, uh, he was almost arrested for that, but the supervisor uh, who was with the police officer said he's one of our employees. Uh, the the uh, supervisor and, and the uh, police officer then proceeded up to the sixth floor, and meanwhile we know that Os Oswald fled the building. And uh, uh, he walked a few blocks Immediately, uh, immediately left the building, uh, uh, and uh, he walked a few blocks and hailed a bus that was s somewhat st stuck in traffic. Uh, when he got on the on the bus, a woman who had been his landlady recognized him getting on the bus. Wow. The, the, the bus uh, proceeded very slowly and got stuck once again. Instantly, this was not a bus that was going to take him to his house. Uh, he, uh, the bus uh, got stuck in traffic again. Oswald asked the uh, bus driver to let him off, uh, got a transfer, uh, walked another couple of blocks to a Greyhound bus station and uh, hailed a cab uh, and asked the cab to, to drive him to a particular location which, which, would, have, which would have been his address. Uh, on North Beckley Street, except he didn't give him the address. He just told him to go out North Beckley Street. Uh, he passed his own house, did not, uh, the, the house I should say was a rooming house. He passed his rooming house, went a few blocks beyond the rooming house, uh, obviously trying to see uh, whether any police cars or anybody had been chasing him, there was any possible person going to arrest him. Uh, so he passed the rooming house, uh, got off, out of the cab a few blocks later, walked back to the rooming house, and at the rooming house got himself a pistol and, and some bullets and a jacket, because uh, it was November. He had actually left his jacket, at his, his jacket that he had been wearing, wearing earlier that day at the Texas School Book Depository. So he, he got a jacket, uh, left the rooming house immediately, began walking in the neighborhood, and was stopped by a police officer uh, who was in a police car named J.D. Tippett. Uh, uh, Tippett, uh, we don't know exactly why Tippett uh, stopped Oswald, but it's very likely that he saw a man who met the description that had been given for the shooter and wanted to check him out. So uh, he stopped the car, Oswald, Oswald stopped walking, Tippett walked to the front of the car, uh, Oswald walked toward him, fired three shots th from his pistol in him, and when he fell to the ground, uh, stood over him and fired a uh, fourth shot in his head. Then he fled, and he took off his jacket, uh, and uh, and he fled uh, to uh, I think it was I think it was North Houston Street, a commercial street uh, with uh, small shops along the way, not not a, not a shopping center type of thing, and uh, there were witnesses to the to the shooting of Officer Tippett. And one of them grabbed Tippett's uh, radio, told the, the uh, dispatcher what had happened, 
And so police cars were then immediately dispatched uh, to the scene of the Tippett shooting. And as Oswald heard the police cars coming, he, he put himself, stopped himself in the entranceway to a uh, shoe store uh, and stood there with his back to the street. And the shoe store manager, a man whose name, last name I think was Brewer, thought this was very strange. Why is, all, with all these police cars, uh, sirens and whatnot, why is this man looking into my store window uh, when he sh should mo most likely have been looking to see what was happening. So he got very suspicious of Oswald. Uh, when the police uh, sirens stopped, Oswald then left the shoe store, walked as quickly as he could to the Texas Theater, which was a few uh, stores uh, storefronts away. Uh, the cashier, uh, who was in a booth at the front of the the theater uh, had herself hearing the police sirens left the cashier's position and was standing at the curb uh, with her back to the to the theater so Oswald was able to walk past the cashier without the cashier seeing him and go into the theater but he did not realize that he was being followed by this man named Brewer who had been the shoe store manager oh, okay. And so uh, when the shoe store manager got to the, uh, to the entrance of the theater, uh, he asked the uh, cashier to call the police. And, and so she called the police. Uh, Brewer went into the theater. Oswald had already gotten in there. And when the police arrived, Brewer was in the theater. Police turned the lights on. Brewer pointed to the man that he had seen, namely Oswald, who was seated in the theater. The police approached Oswald. When the police officer got to Oswald, Oswald pulled a gun and tried to shoot him. The police officer was able to grab the gun and stop it from going off, and he was arrested. All this within approximately an hour of the shooting of President Kennedy. Now, I want to ask you as a lawyer, what do you what do you think of the state's case at that point against Oswald? I would say it's really strong. <laughs> well, we've got a whole lot of circ a lot of evidence here, a lot of evidence, like, direct and circumstantial. Ab absolutely. So, the Dallas police charged him with the assassin. And and what do you 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 got two crimes, right? You've got the you got the murder of Officer Tippett, who there were witnesses to, and incidentally, the the bullets that were found in in uh, Tippett's body uh, matched the, what would have come out of the pistol that was Oswald's pistol. So, you know, the Chief Justice said to us at one point, and he was a former, he had been a prosecutor uh, in Alameda County, California for 10 years and a very well-respected prosecutor. <laughs> the Chief Justice said to us at one point, that if he were trying that, that case, he would have con convicted Oswald in three days. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so we don't have to get into all of this other stuff about what does the autopsy show? All the, you know, if you didn't, if, if, you know, if this, if this were back in the 1700s, well, they wouldn't, w perhaps wouldn't have been 1700, I don't know what kind of guns they had in those days. But you know, if this were back at a time be before we had all this kind of forensic evidence, he would have convicted under any circumstances of shooting the president. Plus, there was, yeah, of course, the other additional crime was uh, attempted uh, shooting of an officer in, in the theater itself. You know, that's right. I mean, well, you know, they didn't even charge him with that. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they did. Yeah, so you got all this stuff going on, and so they get Oswald. He's arrested, and now we let's fast forward a couple of days to where uh, enter your the, your. Uh, uh, the person you investigated the most, Jack Ruby, uh, we well, know that he was at the Western Union that day, wasn't he? J Jack Ruby, yes. Uh, Jack Ruby spent the weekend that is fri from Friday night uh, through Sunday morning trying to be as 
close to the police action as he possibly could to try to find out what the police were discovering about Oswald. But he did some things along the way. Uh, on, uh, after attending, of all things, and, and, and my book shows, shows a photograph of this, uh, attending a press conference held by, uh, conducted by uh, 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 Chief Prosecutor Henry Wade, incidentally, who is the Wade of Roe v. Wade. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, at which uh, a, a midnight press conference on Friday night at which Oswald was displayed, uh, we have a picture of Ruby standing in a group of uh, news media people with, uh, with, with a uh, notebook in one hand and a pen or a pencil in the other hand, taking notes on what Henry Wade was saying. Uh, he left. He left the press conference, and uh, then uh, at about two or three o'clock in the morning, he was uh, at the uh, afternoon newspaper of, of Dallas, canceling his ads in the uh, in the newspaper, canceling his ads for the Carousel Club, his nightclub. And actually, uh, we know that one of the things he did earlier in the day, on Friday, was to, to create some hand, handmade clothes signs and closed his nightclubs. Okay, uh, it's uh, about three o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. He's still awake. Uh, he goes to his apartment uh, awakens his roommate. Uh, he's he's a single man. Uh, uh, Ruby has never been married, uh, and uh, he has a he has a roomer with him who's only frankly been, been living with him a couple of months, named George Senator. Uh, he awakens George Senator, and calls his night watchman Larry Crayford, because he wants Crayford to to get him his photograph. And the three of them, Senator Crayford and Ruby, uh, go to check out and impeach, and impeach Earl Warren billboard. This is about four o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning because uh, he, he believes, that is, Ruby believes that the impeach Earl Warren billboard might be somehow related to the black bordered Bernard Weissman advertisement. And he, he, he wants to see if the he wants to, to take photo, a photograph of the billboard. Incidentally, uh, uh, Ruby uh, was such a uh, politically knowledgeable person that he didn't know who Earl Warren was. <laughs> so, so, so anyhow, they, they take a photograph of the impeach Earl Warren billboard. They then go, they then go to the post office and try to get a post office person to tell them who had taken, whose post office box number was on the impeach Earl Warren billboard and who was, who was the person whose post office box number was on the Bernard Weissman ad. Well, of course, the, the, uh, the, the postal person wasn't gonna tell them that. But that, that was part of what he was doing in, in this search for the possible conspiracy. Okay, then, then he, he kept doing the same kind of thing throughout the rest of Saturday. Uh, he, he gets a, a phone call on Sunday morning, uh, wakes him up, and uh, from one of his uh, dancers, uh, I, I, I kind of use that as a polite name, uh, she, 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 was, she was a striptease dancer, Name, whose stage name was Little Lynn. Little Lynn uh, had not danced that night because Ruby had closed his nightclubs. And he, I guess he paid them only when they danced. So uh, she, she needed money. She called him early uh, Sunday morning to tell him 
that she needed money to pay her landlord to get food. And Ruby said, well, he, he'd be going downtown and he would go to the Western Union office and he would send her a money order. Uh, and that's what he did. Now, the, and this was perhaps 1045 in the morning when he finally got in his car. Uh, the, the day before, the police department had announced that Oswald was going to be moved from the police department uh, to the sheriff's office sometime after 10 o'clock. But you know, you would have thought that if Ruby were planning to go and uh, uh, assassinate Oswald, he would have certainly have got there by 10 o'clock when it was suggested that he might be moved as early as 10 o'clock. But R Ruby clearly left his uh, uh, apartment after it was announced that, that that was the time of the possible movement. And he drove to the Western Union office. Uh, and uh, he took with him to the Western Union office in his car his favorite dog. He, he, uh, he was a dog lover. He had seven dogs. And, and he called them his family. And he called the dog that he took in his car that Sunday morning, uh, whose name was Sheba, he called Sheba his wife. And, and uh, so he drove with Sheba to the Western Union office, which was one block from where Oswald was being held at the Dallas police station. He left Sheba in the car in the parking lot, walked across the street to the Western Union office, stood in line uh, to send a money order to Little Lynn, and we know that from the timestamp on, on the, and stood behind somebody, uh, 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 and we know uh, from the timestamp on the Western Union money order that the uh, uh, money order was sent at 1117. He walked out of the Western Union office, saw a crowd standing outside the exit from the uh, Dallas Police Station garage, uh, walked to the entrance to the garage and uh, across the street from where the uh, crowd was standing. And just as he got to the entrance to the garage, a police car exited the garage. He was able to walk behind the police car while the guard at the top of the ramp was facing out into the streets so that he would not necessarily be seen and, and walked uh, into the, the awaiting news media people and police officers in, inside the garage. And we know that he shot Oswald at 11.21, four minutes after he sent the Western Union money order. Now, come on, Where's, is this a conspiracy? Do you take your dog to, to the point that you're planning to shoot the, the assassin of the president? When he was wrestled to the ground, that is, when Ruby was wrestled to the ground and taken upstairs, uh, Secret Service agent Forrest Sorrells asked him, Jack, why did you do it? And Ruby's answer was, I had to show the world a Jew had guts. Oh, the, the, the tie into the Weissman thing. You know, that was a, 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 perhaps not the only motivating factor, but that was a major motivating factor. Ruby thought he'd be a hero. Yeah. You know, Ru, Ru, Ruby fully expected to be released from jail uh, you know, of course, he never wasn't released from jail. Uh, uh, he uh, wound up going to trial and getting the, the death penalty. But the death penalty was reversed. And, and the trial was reversed because of improper activities by the police department, which we may want to, uh, or not by the police, well, both, both by the police department and the judge. Now we may want to get into the trial at, at some point. I don't know if we have time for that. But, uh, well, just uh, I think it, without getting into a lot of detail, it, it, your book identifies the fact that both Judge Brown, I believe his name was, yes, and Melvin Bell Joe, Bell Joe Brown. Joe Brown, thank you. And Melvin Belli had actually signed book contracts. Unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. Judge, Judge Brown had already received a $5,000 advance uh, for the book he was going to write at the conclusion of the trial. Now, you know, I'm sure we have listeners who aren't lawyers, but th think about this. Uh, the first, one of the first motions that Ruby's lawyers filed in this case was a motion for what's called change of venue, mm -hmm. to move the uh, trial from Dallas to some other city. And if uh, the trial were moved to another city, Joe Brown, who got the book contract, uh, wouldn't be able to write his book about the trial. <laughs> and, you know, totally. Uh, and so, and, and you know, and there's more to it than that. And we, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, but there's something we should think about in today's world. I don't, I don't expect any of the judges in the many high-profile cases that are now going on with respect to American politics. Okay, but we've got lots of them going on, and the Ruby trial is a good example of how greed. <laughs> And publicity and other, other kinds of self-dealing can affect uh, how cases are tried. Out of a curiosity, uh, you outlined the fact that he was convicted, convicted, a uh, life sentence, I believe? Uh, a death sentence. Oh, death sentence, excuse me, death sentence, and then that was reversed. But you at the Warren Commission, now here you are, one of the associate counsel, make, Jack Ruby makes himself available to you to be interviewed. That's right. How did that work? Um, Ruby wanted to be interviewed. Yeah. And uh, the, the interview was conducted by Chief Justice Warren and one other commission member, Gerald Ford, and the general counsel, J. Lee Rankin, in Dallas at the Dallas County Jail. Uh, Chief Justice Warren had gone to Dallas that day for a number of purposes, uh, and one of which was to see the crime scene. Uh, and, and the person that accompanied him, the staff person that accompanied him was uh, Arlen Specter, who had responsibility uh, for that kind of investigation. When, when the questioning began, Ruby was so eager to talk that the Chief Justice forgot to swear him in. <laughs> and after he talked for a few minutes and, 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 uh, and the Chief remembered that he hadn't been given an oath, the oath was given and uh, Again, the interview went forward with, with, with the Chief Justice scarcely asking any questions. But at some point very early on in the interview, uh, Ruby turned to the questioners and asked, is anybody Jewish? Well, there was nobody who was Jewish that was in the questioning. Uh, the only person who was Jewish who had gone to Dallas was Arlen Specter who was seated on another floor in the Dallas County Jail. So the questioning was stopped. <laughs> Specter was found, and he was brought up to the interview room. Oh my gosh, really? And Ruby then said to uh, Specter in a very slow, low, low voice, are you a Yid? <laughs> And, and uh, Spectre didn't know how to answer that. And so he asked again, are you Yid? And I, I guess he, he became satisfied that Ruby, that Spectre was Jewish, that he went on with the interview. But, but it, it, it speaks to, to how important fear of anti-Semitism was in Ruby's mind and how the statement that he made uh, uh, why did you do it? I had to show the world a Jew had guts. He, he believed that if 
someone who was Jewish killed the assassin of the president, that Jews would be exonerated, would not, would not be blamed for the assassination. Now, another thing, we'll, we'll maybe get to, I don't know whether we want to get to this at this point or not, but uh, one of the things we know about, uh, about Oswald, of course, is that he attempted to assassinate uh, a former general, Edwin Walker, who lived in Dallas. And I think uh, that w when we get to that, uh, a, a, there was a factor that came after the attempt to assassinate uh, Edwin Walker that, that played a role unwittingly in Ruby's concern about Jews being blamed for the assassination. But I'll, I'll, I'll save that for later. So I'm envisioning this amazing, I, you know, you, you don't hear much about it, but here's in a room in the Dallas prison. County jail. County jail. The Chief Justice of the United States, a Congress or Senator, Senator Congressman, Gerald Ford, who will be president. Yes. Arlen Specter, who will be United States Senator. Yes. All in one room at one time talking about the assassination through the guy who killed Oswald. I mean, that's almost yes. surreal. Yes. And, and you know, you don't hear about this. No. T tell me, you know, why, why do the conspiracy writers not want to talk about this, as you say, this, this surreal component of this set of events? And, and, and it's not the only surreal <laughs> component, it, oh, yeah. but, but uh, and maybe we will talk later about why thinking about, why writing books about conspiracies or, or making movies about c conspiracies for which there is zero evidence. There is no evidence that connects any possible conspirator to Ruby at a, at a point would, which would have been relevant. Yes, he knew people that were involved in organized crime. Uh, but you know, I knew somebody who was involved in organized crime. My den father, when I, when I was a Cub Scout in the sixth grade, had been known as Big Al of the Prohibition Days Polizzi, and we lost my den father because he got arrested. He was a terrific den father, but does that make me some kind of a conspirator, and, and something, and and this this was this was the kind of not quite as remote as what I'm telling you about myself, but this was the kind of remote connections that Ruby had, uh, uh, and yes, in in the uh, business that he was in, he was he was in he he knew and was in contact with people who might be in the organized crime world. But th that doesn't make his, uh, uh, this is guilt by association, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, and when you know exactly what Ruby was doing, and we tried to trace Ruby on a minute by minute basis from the time he ever could have known about the assassination of President Kennedy, and we were unable to find that there was any connection be th between anything Ruby did or said and people who might, be an organized crime, and as one of as the as one of the men who testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations that, that was conducted 15 years after the uh, Warren Commission investigation, uh, the the person who was the the detective in charge of looking after organized crime in Dallas, he said. If, if Ruby was a member of organized crime, organized crime needed a new human resources director. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you knew Ruby, and you knew what he did, and, and you would, you'd hire a blabbermouth, a guy, an attention seeker like Ruby? Come on, you know. Uh, so, uh, in, in, uh, in another factor I, I want to I put in here, Ruby got the death penalty. If Ruby, if there was a conspiracy and Ruby could have fingered a conspirator, 
He'd have made a, he could have made a deal with Henry Wade. He, he, he could, he, 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 even if he was given the death penalty, he, he could, could have got out of it by making some kind of a deal. Yeah. So, so, and, and Ruby never at any point told any of his lawyers or ever at any point, in fact, he denied repeatedly that he, was a, that he had any conspirators. So it's the people who, who make these movies about Ruby in a conspiracy or write books about it, you know, they're interested in making money to write books <laughs> and make movies, and they're not interested in finding out what the accuracy, what the truth was. As Chief Justice Warren said, your, your only client is the truth. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when he, because ultimately, just to conclude the, kind of quickly, the, the Ruby story, uh, he did have a chance to, to meet with the Chief Justice. He did investigate. Uh, he did, the uh, convictions were overturned. It was on appeal, or I think on appeal at the time. Uh, actually, it, had been, it was not on appeal. It, 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 the, the appeals court had re reversed the original trial, the Joe Brown trial, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and and the case was being set for tr for a second trial. Yeah, okay. And he died. He he died of cancer. Was there any sense? Was there any any deathbed comments? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He 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 wrote a letter, uh, uh, and and he uh, and he he uh, he he drafted or dictated. And I'm not sure he signed it, but he but he 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 dictated a, uh, a last will and testament, and he made it and he stated explicitly in there that he was not part of a conspiracy. Well, yeah, you you I think you put that one to rest. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? I don't think these things are ever put to rest. There will always be somebody who who comes up with something to dispute what, whatever, whatever I've been saying. So obviously Ruby's killing of Oswald ended any chance to get here from Oswald what he did. So now as part of the Warren Commission, you're sort of tracing his steps as well. That includes, we're going to now tie back to Walker. Yeah. But the, 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 uh, you interviewed, I believe, Mary, Mary, uh, his wife, um, Mariana, Mariana, Marina. Uh, Marina. Marina. Thank you. And somehow learn about the Walker thing. Yes, um, and the story really begins with Walker, as far as Oswald is concerned. Although, although I'll, I'll retract that. The story really begins in understanding Os Oswald's personal history almost from the time he was born because he was a very neglected child. Uh, and uh, he, but, but the most relevant parts of the, the possibility of, uh, of trying to understand why he shot President Kennedy uh, begins when he, when he comes back from the Soviet Union uh, with his wife Marina and their four-month-old child. Uh, June, Junie. Uh, he he left the Soviet Union. Uh, well, he had been in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, he uh, when he got out of the Marine Corps, he went immediately to the Soviet Union because he he was a Marxist, and he believed that he could find the perfect society in Marxist society, and therefore he went to the Soviet Union. He became very dissatisfied with the Soviet Union and soon decided that he wanted to come back to the United States. Uh, but the one thing he got out of the Soviet Union was Marina, a very attractive, very bright uh, 18 or 19 year old girl uh, who al also had an unhappy life, who really looked upon herself as an orphan. Uh, and. Uh, Oswald was not a bad-looking guy, and uh, and so for a variety of reasons, which I I think I, I would urge uh, people who are interested in Oswald's personal life to read a book by Priscilla McMillan called uh, Marina and Lee, 
uh, and uh, McMillan has insights into Oswald and into Marina, which are extremely important. But in any event, uh, he left the Soviet Union with Marina and his newborn child, uh, returned to Texas. Uh, his brother was living in Fort Worth, not in Dallas. Uh, came back to live with the family for a few weeks until he could get a job with, uh, with uh, his brother Robert. Uh, and then uh, did get a job in Fort Worth. Uh, and at, at, this, at this particular time, uh, the, uh, the battle over racial integration was at its height. And General Walker became one of the leading opponents of racial integration in the South. Uh, he had been released uh, or he had left, he had been released of his command uh, in, uh, in Germany uh, by President Kennedy be, uh, because he was distributing John Birch Society literature, right-wing literature, to his, uh, uh, to, to the uh, troops in, in, under his command. Uh, and uh, so he was relieved of, of that command, and as a result, uh, he, he quit the Army. He came back to Texas and became an active participant, an active leader in the John Birch Society movement. And when he became that kind of active leader, uh, a newspaper to which the uh, which Oswald subscribed, The Worker, which was the communist newspaper in the United States, called Walker another Hitler. Now, now let's take us then to the summer of 1962, when Oswald returns to Fort Worth. And what is going on at that time? Uh, as the school integration is very much in the headlines, for the coming year, and and what is taking place in Mississippi? Uh, are are you permitted to be a speaker in this? Yeah. Sure. Go go ahead and tell us because you know about James Meredith. Oh sure. Well, at that time, uh, James Meredith, who was a uh, uh, retired, or, well, he had he'd left the, uh, as a vet. He was uh, Meredith at the time was late twenties, maybe early thirty. Yes. Uh, so he's he was a seasoned guy, and so he. Uh, Complying or and had, had, had done a couple of uh, uh, got a couple of court orders and uh, was going to uh, attempt to be integrate the uh, the sign in to be admitted. John Doerr, uh assisted assistant U.S. Attorney General, uh, came and helped him. And so, long story short, you know, he, he confronted Ross Barnett, Governor Barnett, at the big famous uh, yeah. scene in Mississippi and. Uh, ultimately, Barnett put on a show. Door and Meredith go back out, and then they go back. And then that was for show. And ultimately, he did get admitted. But yeah, that was a big, big cause celeb. Okay, so this is late September mm -hmm. of 1962. Uh, Oswald is still living in Fort Worth, but uh, and. And Walker uh, is living in Dallas, but the, the integration is taking place of the University of Mississippi in, in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, all of this is front page headlines. Uh, and, and I will say that uh, uh, Oswald was a newspaper junkie. Mm. Uh, and uh, so uh, when Walker attempts to, in, to enroll and to enter the University of Mississippi uh, when Meredith attempts to uh, integrate the, the University of Mississippi. Walker goes to Oxford, Mississippi mm -hmm. and leads a crowd of protest. Uh, thousands of people. Uh, the National Guard has to be called. Uh, 
fighting occurs, gunshots occur, uh, three uh, uh, protesters are killed, uh, well, two protesters and one newspaper person is, is killed, uh, and uh, 100, uh, approximately 100 National Guards people are injured. The next day, Walker is arrested. And, uh, and he uh, is first taken to a federal mental hospital uh, in Missouri, but fairly quickly makes bond. And when he, and when he returns to Dallas, and by this time, incidentally, uh, Oswald has, well, I'm not sure whether Oswald is now in Dallas or not. But, but in any event, whether it's Fort Worth or Dallas, uh, when Walker returns to Dallas, he's greeted at the airport by a bevy of signs which are praising him and, and some of which are saying, Walker for president. Mm. The worker, the, mag the communist magazine to which uh, Oswald's uh, newspaper to which Oswald subscribes republishes its anti uh, Walker editorial uh, accusing Walker of being a potential Hitler. Uh, all of this makes front, front page, uh, the, the, well, the, the editorial doesn't make front page newspaper, but, but the, the activities of Walker make front page uh, Texas newspapers, Dallas, Dallas papers. Uh, ultimately, uh, which should not surprise anybody, uh, in January of 1963, now this is, a, what, the arrest occurs in October of 1962. Uh, in January of 1963, uh, you won't be surprised to learn that a Mississippi grand jury declines to indict Walker. No, 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 no surprise. What, what you don't know is that two weeks after the grand jury decides to, uh, declines to indict Walker, Oswald buys his first weapon. And he buys a pistol. And then he begins to case Walker's house. And, and it becomes clear that he can f fire from a hidden place. He doesn't have to go right up to Walker and shoot him with a pistol. So he orders the weapon, with wh the rifle, with which he assassinated President Kennedy. And we know that on April 10th of 1963, he did try unsuccessfully uh, because the, the shot that he fired from a hidden place got deflected by a pane in the window. Uh, and he fired one shot, he fled, and we know that he fired the shot because he told Marina this. And Marina, ta and, and he even left her a note because he thought he might, might never return. And so he, uh, he, left, he left her a note uh, telling her what should be done if, if he, got arrested or one reason or another didn't return. But he, he did return. He did not get caught. He did not get suspected. And uh, when Marina asked him why he did this, why he shot at Walker, his answer to her was that if somebody had killed Hitler before he came to power, millions of lives would have been saved. So, so the rifle, just so you understand, the rifle, he purchased the rifle with pure intent to take out Walker, and that's the same rifle that ultimately, a few months later, he took out the president. That's right. Wow. Now, how does this tie in to Jack Ruby? It ties into Jack Ruby because within a, about a week of shots having been fired at uh, Walker, and no one having been arrested, the Walker supporters engaged in an extended period of anti-Semitic vandalism. Uh, 
both with houses of, of, of Jewish merchants, with Jewish owned stores. Now, I don't have any evidence as to how, as to whether uh, Ruby w w uh, was aware of this. But uh, having uh, a few Jewish friends, including my wife, uh, I, uh, I don't think that any, that anybody who was Jewish and living in Dallas with anti-Semitic vandalism going on would not have known about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's unthinkable to me. So that, 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 that I think this is a factor in Oswald's feeling that Jews would be blamed for the assassination. But no one wants to, no one, you know, your conspiracy uh, writers don't uh, talk about any of this. Okay, so uh, where are we then? Uh, Oswald has shot at Walker. He is not detected in any way. He comes home and tells Marina what he's done. Marina's frightened. She persuades him to move to New Orleans. So in May of 1963, the, uh, uh, he goes to New Orleans, looks for a job, gets a job, gets Marina to come and live with him with their baby. But this is, but, uh, but New Orleans is, is simply a way station to Cuba because what he really wants, he's failed politically, and we haven't gone into the rest of the U.S. politics that have been occurring in Walker's life, or in Oswald's life, but he's failed, he's failed in U.S. politics. And what he really wants to do is join up with the Castro government and help Castro spread Marxism to the rest of Latin America. So in September, late September of 1963, uh, he moves Marina back to uh, back from back to Dallas. And I understand they've been living in New Orleans. He moves her back to Dallas to live with Ruth Payne, and uh, and he doesn't really move. But Ruth Payne comes and picks uh, Oswald up and takes her back to live with uh, with with her in Dallas or in Irving, Texas. And uh, Oswald goes to Mexico City. Mm. And in Mexico City, uh, he tries, uh, he goes to the Cuban embassy, uh, tries to get admission to uh, uh, Cuba, uh, and uh, through a series of steps, anyhow, they turn him down. So he, then Oswald then returns to Dallas. This is on October 3rd, 1963. How many weeks? Six, seven weeks before the assassination? Let us say seven weeks before the assassination. His mind has not been on anything. Uh, okay, but his wife is expecting a second child. And on October 19th, I believe it is, she has her second child. She's in the she's in the hospital with her child, and and he's and Oswald is living in a rooming house uh, in Dallas. Uh, does he go to see Marina and the child in the hospital every night that she's there? The answer is no, uh, because. On the night of October 20th, I believe it is, a day, a day or two after uh, the, ch the second child is born, he goes to be in the audience at a rally uh, uh, being conducted by General Walker. <laughs> and why, what's, what's all the rally about? He's not a supporter of General Walker. The, the Walker, purpose of the Walker rally is to organize Walker supporters to disrupt the next day in Dallas a speech to be given by Adlai Stevenson. Uh, and that does happen. The speech is disrupted. And uh, one of the Walker supporters winds up striking <laughs> uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson on the forehead with a protest sign. Wow. This, this makes 
front page newspaper, TV newspaper, and so forth. The, uh, the Dallas, one of the Dallas Democratic Party committee men urges Kennedy not to come to Dallas. Uh, uh, he's concerned that something similar is going to happen to Kennedy if Kennedy comes to Dallas, that the Walker people will do what, what will do to Kennedy what the Steven, what they did to the Stevenson people. But at the time was United Nations ambassador, right? Yes. Uh, so, and the the Dallas uh, public officials are very concerned that Walker is going to be a problem uh, if, when Kennedy arrives. Uh, and so, so both the Secret Service and the Dallas police uh, are trying to be in touch with all, and keep an eye on all of the Walker people. Walker himself is so concerned that if anything happens to Kennedy that he will be blamed, that he arranges to be in Louisiana on, on November 22nd. And when he hear, hears that uh, Kennedy has been shot, he's on an airplane. And, and apparently, not surprisingly, when the word gets out that, that uh, Kennedy has been shot, even people on airplanes are, are somehow learning that the president has been shot. So Walker is on a commercial air, airline flight. He goes to the attendants at, at the, on the flight to, to identify that he is there at the flight and to get their names and addresses in case he has to be in contact with them, in case he's accused of assassinating the president. There is his alibi. Yep. So I want to short circuit this, Greg, but simply my conclusion is that Oswald expected and hoped that the Walker people would be blamed for Kennedy's assassination. Mm. Uh, that if he could, if as he had done with Walker, he, he, he fired from a, a, a hidden place and never got caught or accused of shooting at Walker, he could do the same thing from the Texas School Book Depository, and if he got away, uh, he uh, uh, that the Walker people uh, would be blamed for the assassination. As I as as was my reaction when I first not not the Walker people, but but my, but my reaction when I first heard that the president had been assassinated uh, or shot at was those damn segregations. Those were the words that stick in my mind. And so that, that's the politics that was going on in 1963, on November 22nd, 1963. And, that, and those are the politics that were in Oswald's mind. And uh, there's, no, there's no evidence that he was involved with the mafia, that he was involved with the CIA, or anybody else. There's zero evidence of this. There's no one seen shooting from the grassy knoll you know, but people, what people have to do is ask the question, who was Oswald? What was he doing? What was on Oswald's mind? Now, my suggestion that what was on his mind was Edwin Walker and that, that somehow getting Walker blamed for killing the president would accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, Oswald wanted to accomplish politically. Sure, that's speculation. But what I'm suggesting is that people have to look at Oswald, just as I've tried to look at Oswald, and, and try to understand what was on Oswald's mind. You know, not what was on the mind of the CIA or what was on the mind of the mafia, but what was on Oswald's mind. Well, one of the things you put in your book, which I, I had no idea again about, was the fact that the day before uh, Oswald was trying to reconcile a little bit with Marina. Right. And uh, that, in fact, that didn't work out well. And when, after all the arrest occurred, they went to her house, they, in fact, found his ring and money there as if whatever attempt he was trying failed. Yeah, he, he left, he took his wedding ring off 
and left it for Marina. Uh, it, and uh, he left her, you know, really a lot of money, $175. That, that, was, that, was, that was real money in 1963. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the evidence is clear that, that he shot Kennedy. And the question is, why did he shoot Kennedy? His marriage was falling apart. That was a factor. He, he had no future. His job was going to come to an end because it was a seasonal job. And he had trouble getting jobs. He was, he was also very upset that the FBI was looking for him and was looking for, uh, and had come out to interview Marina. Ten days before the, he assassinated President Kennedy, 10 or 12 days before he assassinated Pre President Kennedy, he went to, to the FBI headquarters in Dallas and left a threatening note to Special Agent James Hostey, threatening to do, and we don't, because Hostey destroyed the note, we don't uh, know exactly what he said, but we know that it was a threat. Now, do you think that someone who is planning to assassinate President Kennedy and was part of a conspiracy would have gone to the FBI uh, uh, and left a threatening note. Uh, he could have very well, should have expected that he might have been arrested for it. So, so it seems to me that by looking at what Oswald was doing, and, and, and incidentally, the conspiracy writers will, will never tell you that he left a threatening note in, in early September for Agent Hosty. They will never tell you about that because uh, that doesn't fit in with their conspiracy theory. But, but the evidence is absolutely clear. Hosty admits that he, that he got the note and that, that he destroyed it. As you draw closure here, and I, you've, been, you've been incredible. You're a great storyteller. <laughs> and, you know, and I know the story, you, this has been part and parcel of your life for 60 years. And uh, you've taken very seriously, because I've read a lot about you, Judge, uh, you know, all the five or six separate official uh, uh, investigations and studies, and they all conclude the same thing. Yes. They all conclude the same thing through various angles, and you've been involved in a few of those. Uh, that here we are on the 60th anniversary, uh, and you got a book out, which has been well received. Can I give give them the name of the book? Please. Okay. We love here. Yes. Okay. It's it, the the title of the book is JFK, Oswald and Ruby: Colon, Politics, Prejudice and Truth. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. Beautiful. Uh, okay. Beautiful videography. Now, now let, me, let me tell you that I, I learned something about punctuation as a result of this title. When I was going to school, it would have been JFK, comma, Oswald, comma, and Ruby. But you know what? Times have changed, and it is now JFK, comma, Oswald, but no comma, and Ruby. Uh, you're raising your hand. Did you, did, you, did you learn it? How did you? That's how I learned it too, and I was subsequently criticized by my law firm when I used it. So, I <laughs> so uh, any anyhow, uh, you know, thank you for saying that th that this is. Uh, you said it was a page turner, and I appreciate your your well, saying. Well, it was. That. It was. I've learned so much not only, but just I've just I've tried to highlight a few things for the listener that the listener is not going to have a clue about because it's your research, your 60 years of this. And, um, and, and is there a legacy? So when they try to draw closure and they hit the last page, that you'd say, I hope they come away with this lesson. I, I, I think the, the lessons, there are multiple lessons here. One lesson is that politi politicians and newspapers and TV have to be very careful and very restrained about what they write. Uh, and the second thing is that there, even today, uh, are scores probably of Oswald's and Ruby's in, the, in America. 
these are somewhat isolated. They're lonely people. They're powerless people. They're people who kind of feel that they're on the fringes of society. And they have a need to do something dramatic, as Ruby had a need to do something dr dramatic. Uh, and his, his, finances were, his finances were not good. Uh, he, he lived a life of having to deal with anti-Semitism. Uh, Oswald's life was falling apart. He, he, was, he had never been uh, a part of any, had never been accepted into any particular organization. Uh, and as I say, he, he couldn't see a future for himself and he, and he wanted to be a hero. He, uh, he, let's put, put it this way, he, he wanted to be a change agent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe there, there are scores of these people in our society. And uh, uh, I don't know that they can ever be uh, identified in advance. But sometimes they can, but they're the real danger to our society. We shouldn't be trying to blame, uh, to blame other people. To do. We shouldn't be using this as a way to, to uh, assemble distrust of government. Uh, uh, we need we we need to believe that people like myself and my other colleagues on the Warren Commission were trying to find the truth. As Chief Justice Warren said to us, our client, your client, is the, is the truth. And, and that, that we were trying to do that. Uh, we didn't perhaps do a, a perfect job, but we were trying to find the truth. And the truth does lie in who Ruby and Oswald were and not in some grandly uh, created conspiracy of people uh, who are either in government or in the private sector. So I think that's the, I don't know if I'm making my, making it clear, but that's, that's, that's the lesson for me. Wow, what a lesson for us. So Cindy and I are just so thrilled that we, you let us into your house. The 60th anniversary to the day you took the time to spend time with us in the Jackson Center. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming here and spending the time.